So first of all, this is another install, another install or part of our series, our uh, featured artist for Gallery 51. And we're here with Todd Elliott out of the Pacific Northwest. Todd, exactly where yeah. are you? I'm in Portland, Oregon, and actually I wanted to show you a little bit of the building because it used to be a, um, uh, a marine works building. So they have a lot of uh, uh, what were the old molds for casting large parts, oh, wow. okay. and they're quite beautiful to look at. So I'm just going to share that with you out here in our space. Okay. And they're quite large. Um, they're very wow. big pieces. and. Um, uh, my friend Dale had installed a lot of these with uh, some help okay. and um, so oh, these all wow. eventually became forged metal pieces for the Marines uh, okay. works so it would be like things that you would see at a dock or on a ship and stuff like okay. that all so right. um, and then um, actually you can kind of like see the hallway here everything kind I of see. really opened up uh -huh. um, there's actually another room far beyond there that's going to be a dance studio and that is going to um, be a, uh, it's a very large place, but that's where a lot of the forging happened back in the old days. Okay. Um, and then I have a couple of my paintings over here. Uh, let's see, here they are. Um, and I wanted uh, to use my iPad today. I thought that that would be probably yeah. the to use. So um, that first one there with the red was actually made in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, and uh, I had some friends help me who were uh, boat builders uh, do this out of fiberglass. So it's uh, technically kind of heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to go a little lighter weight on some of the materials. And then this one here is um, something that was inspired by my living in Southern California. And, um, and just seeing the morning light along the 210 freeway. Um, but there's some really nice um, quality to the iridescence in the, in the paint. And um, so you get like these nice um, colors of uh, purple and greens and golds and whatnot. Um, and then this is the studio here. Uh, and I'll walk you all around there after a bit, but, um, but we're in Portland, Oregon. So we got here because my wife is a um, shoe designer and now she's director of design uh, with Columbia and that brought us out here. Okay. And I, I love it here. <laughs> I, I didn't That's think great. I would. You hear all these, you know, stories <laughs> like, oh, it's crazy out there. And, and um, there's tons of rain. But really, the rain isn't that bad. And I would rather have the rain instead of um, snow. And, oh, um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, we have snow in the mountains. So it's only an hour away. So <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Silly. Uh, we get snow in higher elevations around the city, so yeah. above 500 feet, um, it would be, uh, there could possibly be some snow there and ice. Um, when it does happen in the city, it sometimes shuts down the city because we don't have any snow removal equipment. Right, right. And um, so it's kind of fun. It's an easy snow day. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Portland's been really wonderful. It's beautiful here. A lot of... Um, Forestration parks, you know, right. you can just go hiking in a, in a in a moment's notice and just be outdoors and and trail hiking. So um, great! It's, I it's really I'm nice. I'm sure people definitely will look you up, and we have all of your website and all the information about you. Um, but we met when you were on the East Coast, and you mm -hmm. had your work up um, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and that's how I was introduced to your work, which is very similar to the work that you just showed us. Yeah. Um, and so now you, that was many years ago, we won't talk about how long that was, but yes. still stays with me. Literally, I love that work and I have some of that work. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could share with us who aren't as familiar with your work as I am, if somebody who didn't know about you or your practice were to ask about you and your practice, what would you say? What would you tell them? Um, it's kind of weird. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of um, different things that have influenced my work. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, 
I actually do a little bit of both design and fine arts. So mm -hmm. I actually design the, the panels that I'm painting on, the, that sort okay. of substrate. And, um, tr and I get inspired by typography um, and sometimes even calligraphy. Um, mm -hmm. and, but those are the things that uh, create the forms. And, um, and now lately I've been doing some new forms, which I'll show and share with you today. Um, that are inspired by um, basically hauling containers or large mixers that you see along the highways, you know, being pulled by trucks. Um, but I've always been interested in transportational graphics is all I can think of, you know, to, to explain it, and sign design. Um, so it's a little bit of um, abstract art, like sort of the high art of mm -hmm. abstraction and um and then a little bit of the pop art you know um because it's it's you know as um roy lichtenstein just described it in a um a long time ago at a caa conference that um pop art is sort of this thing where reality is always happening and the pop artist just kind of takes something out of reality and isolates it and, and in their case it was always something about commercial art Mm -hmm. And um, the things that they saw uh, in, in signs or in comic books or on a Campbell soup can, but they, mm -hmm. they wanted to just select that, isolate it and change it just enough, you know, and it became art. And so I'm constantly doing that. And my observations are um, uh, always happening and I'm always inspired. And, um, and I think that doggone Instagram is probably one of the worst <laughs> things ever invented because I could spend some good time on there looking at what other people are doing and, and uh, looking at great photography. Um, and um, so it's, uh, it, it's been, you know, um, a great way. And I, I keep also, actually I'll talk about this in a minute, but um, I keep an archive of images. So, you know, back in the days when we didn't have Google, I was uh, finding things and keeping it, and I just really mm -hmm. can't part with it. And it's not mm -hmm. like I'm um, um, uh, a hoarder or anything like that. These are just really valuable pieces to me mm -hmm. that I've collected over 20 and 30 years. So, How long have you been practicing? About that long? Um, yeah. Um, so I've been doing art for 20 years since grad school, but I've been doing it for 10 years prior. Okay. And my um, my initial art experience was always with um, representational art and realism. And there just got to be a point that I just, as I described it going into um, uh, RISD when I was going to grad school um, during my interview was, um, I felt like sort of a caged dog circling and not really able to generate new work. And I knew there was something bubbling under I just didn't know what it was right. so um, uh, and that sort of helped give me some direction mm -hmm. and um, and I found myself making these sort of pop um, pieces and abstract work and and um, and I think there's um, abstracts taken in the wrong context um, mm -hmm. if you really think about the word abstract it also sort of relates to the word ex extract Mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of like, as, as almost Lichtenstein had um, talked about, pulling things from reality. That's exactly what abstract art does. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just that it's a, a different form of representation where it's, it has more of the artist's voice in it than it right. does anything else. But honestly, I find representation in a Mark Rothko painting, you know, it's to me still a landscape. I mean, there's always a horizon and two different color fields. Um, <clears throat> or maybe three color fields. Um, so there is still a sense of reality in um, abstract work, and that's the way I look at it too. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're anxious to see what is going on in your studio. How, however, you'd like to give us a little tour and yeah, let us see that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to actually be able to show you a little bit of the process too because oh, great. I've been doing some work. Um, so. Uh, Actually, I'm preparing to do, are you still there? Yes. Okay, I feel like I just lost you. Yeah, we lost your camera, but let's see. Hmm, let me just pop this back on. Yeah. Okay, I think there we go. Good. All right, very good. So um, I have um, 
things that are happening, but I do have my older work hanging up and um, uh, it still kind of uh, inspires me to have these things around. Um, and actually I did a piece that's kind of unlike anything else I've done before. Um, and I finished it recently, probably about a month ago. And I kind of consider it my, um, my Joseph Stella number five, in a way. but um, I was kind of trying to remember why I've been so interested in sign graphics and, um, and actually things that move and, and transportation itself. But as a child growing up, we would spend um, a lot of trips, usually once a month or once every two months to go visit grandparents that were about 150 miles away. And sometimes we would leave on a Friday night and um, after my dad got off of work. So I actually did this painting using one of my panels and it's not shiny or anything like that, but it's um, sort of a, a memory. I don't know if I can bring this up, um, but it's on one of my forms and, um, and it's just a highway scene um, that I can recall. And I even went so far as to put the highway numbers down and the destinations. Um, and also a, um, an illuminated gas station because uh, these plastic panels that I make um, are made by the same people who make those illuminated signs uh, for like a shell station or um, a Dunkin' Donuts. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that we do see, uh, they're in Lynn, Massachusetts. They're called plastic graphics. And I still have a few of the older panels with me here in the studio and I will use them, but I think I'm gonna be using them in a different purpose than some of the ways I have here. Um, so just kind of give you an idea of that space and what I've been working on. So um, it's gonna go right over here to this piece I started on last year, um, toward the end of the year. Um, and it is uh, wood veneer on a, uh, basically a, a, a substructure that I built out of MDF and I wanted to kind of bring into my work um, some of the um, immediacy, I guess, of um, making art. And so this is actually a charcoal drawing on wood. And, um, and I think it's still a work in progress. <laughs> so I mean, that's the other thing I like about this is that I don't really feel like it's finished yet. And mm -hmm. I could pop back into it at a moment's notice if I feel like there's something I need to do to it. Right. Um, which is always something I, I always enjoyed as a balance in making art. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to have that completeness or, oh, it's all done, it's all finished kind of a thing. Right. So, um, and it, it kind of got me back to my uh, drawing sensibilities too. Um, so I'll be making more of these. And what I have in front of me here, and I hope I can show you this, is a... Um, a little bit of a foam mold. I don't know if you can see that or not. Mm -hmm. um, I'm using insulation foam and it's just starting to um, come together and I will carve it into basically what you saw, saw on the wall here. Okay. And this will become the mold that I'll use um, for something called vacuum bagging. And it's where you can take plywood and mold the plywood over these forms just using um, basically um, uh, wet, and glued uh, plywood and uh, just sucking the air out of it. And it just sort of just takes the form. It's sort of like when I have these large plastic panels vacuum formed, they're heated up <clears throat> and, and then formed over an MDF uh, mold. But um, here I'm going to be just um, using um, very thin plywood and, and getting these uh, forms made. Um, it's not too dissimilar to what, you know, and this is a bad example because it's all broken, but, um, but this lovely chair here, um, a Jacobson chair, I believe, um, but it was, um, it's all uh, molded um, plywood and you can okay. form it. The Ames were the other uh, couple that used to um, do that for furniture. Right. So I have that kit and um, it costs roughly around $250. Um, they send you the hoses and the bags. Um, skateboarders use them to make okay. their decks. decks. So uh, I'm going to be doing that. Um, that's what awesome. I've been working on this week, actually. Okay. And then I have another mold here that's halfway done that I could share with you. And um, because I had a trouble with the, um, I hope I can get this right. 
um, I had trouble with the um, uh, the foam itself, so I ended up painting some latex over it uh, so I could put some uh, filler on it. And I'm smoothing it out right now, but this is the back half of that form here, which I'm gonna just pick this up here and show you. This is the back half here, still waiting for foam. Um, but you can see some of the complexities of these angles. And I'll talk a little bit more about these angles in a moment because they've been um, a source of my work ever since I did these, you know, uh, relief panels here, uh, like you see above here. So, mm -hmm. um, and that, what you see plastic bagged over here is uh, <laughs> because I do a lot of dusty work, but it's my archive. So I have like old model car kits and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and I still build models if I have time, but I don't right now. So <laughs> uh, I haven't built a model since uh, grad school. So it's been 20 years, um, but I have a line. I have I have um, five kits up there that I'm, you know, someday will build when I have sure. some time, and I'm not going to get rid of them. So yeah. Um, but uh, do you have any questions about that? No. So it seems like the your. I think we you had told me in another conversation that you were kind of looking at changing some of the materials that you had previously used that would be more, I don't know, eco-friendly. I was um, hoping, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of a reflection of that with using the kind of the, the wood molding kit versus having them manufactured or fabricated at the plastic. Um, yeah, I think the worst thing I'm using right now is the insulation foam, and I'm not very proud of that, but it's an economical way of doing that, and I can get multiple, um, basically, uh, presses out of it. Okay. So, um, but I do want to get more wood and metal into my work and aluminum, and um, so I've been doing some small maquettes of that, and I'll share that with you soon, too. Um, but... Um, yeah, that kind of just goes back to, um, you know, these were the forms as I used to receive them from plastic graphics. They would come, okay. you know, like this. I would make the molds uh, up until a point that they said that they could do it quicker um, using a CNC router. So I eventually went with that and um, the molds were very heavy. They're all made out of MDF and then they would vacuum form them um, over that. Um, but yeah, I do. I want to get into other materials because I think the other thing is is that it um, um, with uh, not necessarily with plastic, but with the, the other uh, materials like with wood and metal, it, it begins to um, increase sort of um, uh, well, it, it, the materials somehow make it more interesting. You know, yeah. instead of just having one material, I can have a vocabulary of a few different things. And, um, and that kind of makes it a little bit more exciting to look at when you have different types of surfaces to look at. Right. Um, yeah. So sometimes I will leave the wood um, veneer exposed. Other times I'll paint over it. Um, other times it'll be transparent. Um, so you get kind of a little play on all of that. And that's what I've been really kind of concentrating on with these maquettes is like, what can I get um, as a visual result with uh, these different materials? Right. So um, I can share that with you too. And I'm trying to remember, because I've kind of went over um, some of the questions that you were asking the other day. And, um, um, but I think, um, you know, I, I'm covering most of it right now. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no. I, I'm curious. I'm sure people are looking at the surfaces of the work. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, because I remember the work that I first saw and, you know, when we finally met you and you talked about it and you referenced, you know, you're visiting your grandparents and, you know, kind of this car experience and, one of the things that struck me most was about, you know, the surfaces, the smoothness, but it also reminded me of how cars have that smooth surface when they're painted. So can you tell us a little bit more about yeah. your process in the painting part and how you... Sure. Decide? Yeah. So um, a lot of the pieces that I have hanging up here right now um, were all done with a uh, water-based acrylic um, automotive paint. And quite honestly, in the industry of automotive paint, if... Um, Car manufacturers, particularly in Europe, aren't using um, uh, 
oh, I'm trying to remember what they call it now. But um, there, there are other options is they're using water-based paints. And then uh, they're clear coating it with the urethane. And a urethane is, um, in this case that I'm using it, it's a clear urethane. Um, a very good friend of mine would um, uh, coat my paintings for me because he had the, the experience. He's a, um, um, a, a car restorationist, so he, he's probably one of the best. And um, he's won awards at car shows and stuff like that. And I met him when I was in grad school. So um, we've been friends ever since. And um, um, But anyway, um, so these paintings are actually, um, you're able to keep them outside if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had uh, people visit me last winter um, before the COVID thing broke out, but they were, they wanted to have a painting for out by their pool. Mm -hmm. um, it would be in the shade, but they understood, yeah, this is, you know, you're using a material that is used in the sign industry to be outside. It has a long life term there. And then um, it's covered in urethane, which is a UV protectant for paint. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can wash it, you can wax it, you know. Actually, I went back and waxed it. Uh, technically, it's not waxing, but um, they call it cut and buff, but go back and polish out the, um, the paintings um, before I had um, uh, open studio back in um, December. Um, so, um, but it, that's the beauty of it all. It's, it's, it's got, you know, a shiny surface if you want that. You don't have to have a shiny surface. You can have a matte surface too. Um, and, um, but it's a great protection for the paint, gives it some longevity and, um, and it gives it luster too, very much like you would if you were to, um, varnish an oil painting, it goes in and brings out the color, uh, and gives it that wet look and, mm -hmm. and that gives it the painting life again. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, it's really, um, it's quite fascinating and it, it's taken years to develop that, you know. I remember, you know, I used to make these panels out of um, uh, wood, wood frames with a sheet of lou on, and then I would laminate plastic on top of that. And these paintings were so heavy they could actually snap um, uh, what were drywall screws out of the wall. So, <laughs> so it was just like, okay, I got to come up with a better solution, you know, because the wood isn't going to help. You know, they were three and four inches thick just at the right. frame. They, they were like stretchers, but they were right. still very heavy paintings because they were large. Right. So it took years to kind of, you know, figure it out. Is it going to be fiberglass? No, it's still a little heavy. And then I just, I'm like, well, who makes these plastic signs, you know? And then I found them. And really the company in Lynn, Massachusetts, is uh, they're called Pan Signs. They're one of the very few companies in, in the country. I think there may be only a couple or three that actually make it. And they're at a prime location because they're at sea level. Mm -hmm. And that helps with the vacuum forming, you know, with the, in terms of pressure, so. I haven't found a company out here yet that does it, and I don't really need them. I have um, more than enough of these panels right now. Right, so, right. Yeah. Yeah, they are really, I mean, because I, I find them amazingly light, but um, just how, how they're so, they're so refined and so, like, precise if you're able to see or, or touch one and then the surface of it too is always. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And, yeah, and you know, it, the ones that is... you have are very tight and, um, and I remember making them, I remember taping them out and masking them. There's a lot of qualities to that um, that are very much like uh, printmaking um, mm -hmm. because of um, the reveal. Like if you ever, like uh pulled a print you don't really see what you get until you pull right. the paper back right. and that's the way it was with painting it's like you start pulling back the tape and you're like wow this is cool you know right and sometimes i've had like technically mistakes and they were cooler than the original thought and right. so i just left it the way it was um and actually i think one of those paintings is in massachusetts at the um brigham and women's hospital down in mm -hmm. foxborough Mm -hmm. um which is kind of neat to see that you know uh, so um but yeah so it's got a little bit of that and I, one of the things that i try to even tell my students is is that you want to be in a part of art where um 
one medium informs the next thing you do, like whether it, you decide to do printmaking or whether you decide to do a drawing or whether you decide to do a sculpture, there should be some sort of lineage or link between mm -hmm. all those different mediums that, that you share. And, and that's what I'm doing here too. I'm like, um, I will be doing some uh, silk screens soon mm -hmm. uh, in the coming uh, months. I was hoping to get down to Texas to do that because I have a friend that has a great studio down there. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that would be like a great Instagram story and the whole thing, you know, to go to this relatively cool studio in Houston and, and pull prints. And um, so hopefully that'll happen as soon as this, pandemic kind of ends and and whatnot but um but that's kind of the thing i'm always looking for is like okay if i did this as in a drawing how can i do this you know somewhere else and i've i've seen it done by countless artists and if you ever look at like an unfinished michelangelo you see the hatchings and the cross hatching like you would mm -hmm. see if, if you were to look at a sketchbook you know or a drawing right. So, um, and it's just him just kind of chipping away in those patterns to get the form. Um, so, yeah, so I'm like looking for that, you know, I'm like always kind of searching for that, that link into the next medium, so. Have you felt like the quarantine or the effects of this pandemic had had a significant influence on your practice or what you're producing or? <laughs> How's that? Been? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. <laughs> I kind of wish I had more materials a, and I wish I had more access to tools. Um, one of the benefits of teaching is, is that um, I can use some of the facilities at the school, but that's completely off limits. I could really use right now a bandsaw. And I used to own a bandsaw, but I sold it before I moved here. Um, so it'd be nice to have access to some of that. And um, so I'm just kind of like, trying to figure out how I can make things with what I have. And mm -hmm. actually one of the, the molds that I just show, showed you earlier, I would have cut that out probably in a different way on a bandsaw and not just the, the foam pieces, but even the, the, the wood base. But I ended up using my circular saw to, to cut that wood base, you know, and mm -hmm. um, which is a little tricky, you know, and it's at 22 and a half degree angles and, um, and it's sort of, um, sort of a, pentagon shape you know um so it was kind of tricky but i you know i set up the table outside and um and just cut that piece out as best i could and and right. i really eyeballed it i couldn't even use uh, a ruler for that you know or mm -hmm. any type of cutting guide uh right. the other thing is that i'm just using things in my studio things that i already own so that's the reason why a lot of this is you know the smaller maquette pieces or you know models Right. And um, I've kind of taken um, taken that whole model concept anyway uh, to heart because I was that kind of kid growing up. That's part of my uh, thing I like to share on Instagram is my um, um, sort of my, um, uh, what do they call that? An image though for my, my, um, my page. But um, I, um, I was that kid, you know, I would go to the basement and build kits and, um, and, and um, I could spend an entire weekend just being by myself and, and building a model kit. I couldn't wait till I had some money from mowing lawns and getting on my bike and biking five miles to this place called Royal Hobby on a Saturday and, <laughs> and buy expensive kits from Japan, but it was so cool, you know, and Right. And um, a great way to just kind of fantasize at the same time as I was building these things as a kid. And I still do that, you know, I'm like still sort of like in the studios become that basement and I um, and I'm just kind of immersed into building things and making things. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely identify with that. Right. Right. Um, when you I see so a lot of the work that it, obviously the image is buried, but you have, you talked a little bit about how um, even, I don't know if you, if you said text or calligraphy influences your work. And so I, as people look around your studio, you have one here that actually has some text versus yeah. a lot of the other ones. Could you tell us why or how you use the text versus not? And is that, well, that was, sentence, is that going to be? That particular one is pretty blatant. Um, it's a um, homage to Ed Ruscha, the mm -hmm. artist. And 
it's based off his 1963 painting called Smash. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I basically did the same layout, but um, I wanted to play with um, the word Rouché and have Touché Rouché because he <laughs> likes to play around with words. And um, so I just kind of like uh, manipulated his name a little bit and then have him ascending up into the border there, much uh -huh. like you would see in the Smash painting. And actually, I um, I looked at the original uh, Smash painting, and there really wasn't any text or font, if you will, that matched it. And I really had to create it, just like he did. But then I created it in pencil, scanned it into the computer, used Adobe Illustrator, and then at that time, I I owned my own um, vinyl cutter, okay. and was able to print it out on the vinyl cutter. And there's a special masking um, vinyl that you can use uh, just for that purpose for painting. And so I did that and um, created that. So I, but um, just the forms themselves, um, uh, even the round one here um, is still inspired by um, uh, the idea of oblique letters or, um, you know, in terms of calligraphy, they, uh, they would refer to it as italic. And that's where it all really began with me is um, trying to make paintings faster. And um, so I re realized this when I was in grad school, I kept making these rectangles, which were um, as, you know, uh, history dictates are the windows of the painters, you know. And, um, and I wanted to get away from that frame, you know. Um, and one of the things that I've always enjoyed was this sort of faster graphic, um, whether it was something, that, you know, I can remember the image of Zippy, uh, the zip code uh, from the US Postal Service back in the 1960s, or I think they called him Zip. And um, he was just this cute little cartoon character, but everything was at a particular angle. Um, and uh, typically, oblique letters and um, numbers are at a preset angle of like eight degrees or 12 degrees from 90. So you, you just kind of go back. So you would get like uh, 82 degrees or 78 degrees from that, that um, right angle. And so I was kind of fudging around with that in grad school and trying to figure out, well, what's faster than that? And I realized that 45 degrees was way too fast. And I said, well, what's half of that? And this gets to be like some num numerological game for me. And it's really kind of weird how it all happened. <laughs> but it turned out it was 22 and a half. And then if you took that from the right angle, you get 67 and a half. And I'm going like, oh my God, this is like some sort of divine message here. I was born in the year 67 on the fifth month. So I got to do this, you know? <laughs> and, um, and when I made that first parallelogram, I probably nearly ended my life because it was so difficult to make um, because I had beveled edges that were at that angle. I had um, then had encountered what the miter would be um, and doing all the math uh, for that, the, the geometry involved with it was very difficult, but I got through it. It was a very long day. I remember leaving the wood shop just feeling like, oh my God, that was amazing. And, um, um, but I ended up having a car accident that night. <laughs> so I was just like, <laughs> just because wow. all I wanted to do was go home and just sit on the couch. And I blew out two of my front tires and then ended up tr trying to change one of the flats and impaled the bottom of my foot. Don't ask how it happened, but it was just one of the worst days. Um, wow. and, uh, but I, I got it, you know, I have this yeah. form. It's uniquely mine. I know how to make it. And, um, and I've been making these, you know, 67 and a half degree forms or 22 and a half, however you want to look at it ever since with that, that beveled edge. And, um, and then some of the other forms that I've come up with, um, Actually, I have it in my, this is my little spray booth here, and I have this just to kind of keep the um, the level of overspray down. I remember the first day I tried to spray here, um, some of it was kind of like flying all over the place, but it turned out it was actually a bad gun. 
and um, a spray gun. So I, um, it needed some fixing, but um, I decided to build this. You know, I had um, a couple complaints from my neighbors and I'm like, you know, no biggie, I'll do this. And so um, I came up with this, this form here years ago. Um, this became a painting called Testoro, but this was influenced by type. And it's just basically looking at, um, this will be painted this week, I think. Um, but it has sort of this midriff, um, uh, I don't know what they call these, um, um, flourish, I guess, that you would find in type, you know, especially old time type, you know, like the old timey stuff, like the mm -hmm. Red Sox logo, you know, mm -hmm. or logo type. It has sort of that um, little line in the middle. And, um, and even this uh, form that I showed you earlier, um, this here is sort of like this widened I guess letter I or something mm -hmm. but it just has all those serifs you know I'm like really interested in those type of forms so those that's where typography kind of comes into play and then I'm sort of abstracting these things so um, actually I can show you on this particular piece I kind of wish I had better light let me just come over here with this I'm doing a paper piece right now um, this is some of the stuff that I'm doing because it's hard to get some supplies, so I'm going to just try to raise this up. But these are sort of the level of abstractions that I'm working with here. I, I got like um, the infamous zero there on the mm -hmm. tip there, but then I'm working on this little logo piece here, which is similar to what was on that black piece that I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and those are sort of inspired by um, those, those abstractions were kind of like those mistakes that I talked about earlier, where you can like peel up the tape right. and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know? So um, I've been playing with that. Um, but um, yeah, and, and then again, you know, it's, um, so type has always been a part of the forms and now I'm getting into um, these transportational containers, which I actually have a few pieces over there too, which are on the website. Um, Oh, and then these are inspiring too. I forgot about this. We got this great place out here in Portland called Scraps. And um, generally when I'm teaching in the summer, which I'm not doing this year, which I'm very sad about, but um, uh, I do a pre-college course. We get kids from all over the country. Um, and um, it's kind of a rigorous program. It used to be three weeks, it's now four weeks. and. Um, we send uh, the students up to this place called Scraps and they just kind of go through all of these used items that can be used for art or some of it is old art supplies. Mm -hmm. And I found these uh, letter forms here and I'm actually oh, wow. using this in work. Uh, this is just a letter S that's been cut out in foam for signage. Um, they I think they charge a little much for that one, but... Um, <laughs> And then like I have like this letter I, I have other letter forms that I picked up, but I'm like, oh, this is great, you know, and right. those are kind of leading to some new abstractions too. I um, came up with some dollar store images like this that are going to be for um, sculpture. Okay. And um, so I'm using um, those sort of, um, I don't know what they call them, you know, it's um, these little forms that look like, oh, I think I have one out here. I was going to show it to you. They kind of started off like these little things mm -hmm. and you buy packets. Okay. But um, I did collages like this. Okay. Just kind of playing with the letter forms and those shapes together. Yeah. That's coming down the road. That's not okay. happening soon. That's like going to happen when I get this other stuff done. But okay. That's the beauty. I mean, I, I, I have so much work to do. <laughs> it's, like, it's crazy. So, um, but I'm happy. And, That's great. Um, but uh, anyway, I just have to see that. I was going to show you the forms. Yeah, so how these do are you... the new... Oh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. I, so I'm wondering, like, with that, so the color palette for what you just showed us is very mm -hmm. different than oh, yeah. Like, how has that evolved and how has that played a role in your work? So it will play. I mean, that's the thing. There's, I actually have about two series ahead um, coming up after I do the work that I'm doing right now. So um, I'm not sure where the bright color one's going to fit in, if it's going to be the next one or the one following the next one. So okay. if you look at it, I'm working on three bodies of work right now. 
Okay. The contain I'm working on the container ones, which I'm about to show you here in a second. Okay. And then, um, and then I'm going to do another piece that was inspired <laughs> recently when I was building a uh, fireplace mantle and and um, for our apartment. I got a whole bunch of different moldings, and um, I got really into the shapes of the moldings. So I might be doing like a Baroque thing um, and Baroque graphics. Yeah, that could be potentially next or the loud color one. So it's okay. either of those two. Um, um, I'm excited by all of it, but I just I yeah. have to get through this series first. Sure. And then I'm into the next one, and then I'm into the next one. So I'm continually right. working. Right. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm, I'm out, you know, three series already and I just have to get stuff done. So, um, Veronica has a question for you. Okay. Hi Todd. So I wanted to ask, um, what your process is for determining the designs that you make? Cause it sounds like you're, you take inspiration a lot from signage that you see around you. And so I'm wondering how do you take that inspiration and then come up with a design? Is it something that just kind of pops into your head and you have an idea of what, how you want to make it? Or do you kind of take that signage that you're interested in and start manipulating it until you get to something that um, kind of strikes you? Yeah, it, 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 it definitely that. I mean, I see things um, in this case with the uh, container forms that I'm working with. Um, those forms I've always been sort of interested in to begin with. Uh, I've, I've known them since I was a kid, you know, fascinated by trucks. And then what I do is, is I, I figure it out, you know, I'm like, what kind of graphics can I apply to it? What kind of paint techniques? Um, but the, it's kind of weird. There may be a bunch of different um, silos, if you will. I have a graphic silo. I have um, one that's about um, the environment. You know, in terms of, I'm not talking about being environmentally, but I'm talking about like the light, the color, uh, the landscape, you know, the placement of where that's, this object's going to be. And then, um, and then the, it's the form too. So um, I'm kind of like going back and forth into a, those three little um, containers and pulling out things. I think the material's getting to be more interesting for me though. And that's the reason why I like to play with the wood. Um, I'm using now um, a uh, frosted mylar, uh, which is kind of hard to glue. I had to buy some like crazy super glue just to get it to stick to cardboard. But um, but it's it, it's a nice tra semi-transparent piece of um, sort of plastic, if you will. Um, and then the metal. So I'm trying to get my vocabulary up with all these different materials and see what I can do with it. Um, just to make it different, you know, because I don't want people to just say, uh, like, actually, somebody in our building, uh, who's also from Massachusetts, <laughs> came by and, and, and we were talking a little bit about the Red Sox and, and whatever, uh, but, and then he was like, um, he was like, I really like your signs. He didn't say, I like your paintings, I like your signs, mm -hmm. which I thought was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, because he, he totally understood him as being, you know, sort of that form. Right. And, um, and so I haven't really thought about the work as being symbolically like what signs and icons are about. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I've taught a class about that, I am really looking at it in a very artistic, um, organic approach in creating and making things. So I kind of hope that answers your question a little bit. So, yeah, yeah, it definitely, it definitely does. And kind of a follow-up but related question was is there anything that kind of stood out to you or do you know maybe why you were uh, attracted to or interested in those um, signs or containers or these things that you saw in your childhood like what made them stand out to you versus other things that were around you it was civilization <laughs> Simply. I mean, it really was because it, when you're out on the highway, there are these points where there's just farm fields and nothing, you know, and then all of a sudden you see the oasis and you're like, ooh, they got ice cream. <laughs> or, you know, you know, it was like, it was always the places my dad didn't stop, you know. <laughs> so uh, in a weird way, it, it's, 
it, it was something that was deferred from me. You know, it was like I couldn't have it. And, and I wanted to stop there or I wanted to see the trucks closer. Um, and they would just sort of pop up. But I've also had experiences as a kid just kind of like walking um, closer to the highway because my grandparents lived not far from a highway. And, and just looking at these things and wondering where are they going? You know, uh, there's a great quote, and I'm trying to remember, um, uh, it was from a photographer, a French photographer by the name of Del Tourmont. And it goes, um, I think it's something like, um, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, no place, wait, how did it go? There's no place, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna get it, so <laughs> never mind. But what he was basically getting at is, is that, Wherever he was, there was something else happening that was way better than where he was. You know, it was like where he was was not the ideal place. And in mm -hmm. um, that he longed to make that trek to some place where they had, you know, civilization. Mm -hmm. and, um, and actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, my son and I drove across country when we moved here, which was amazing. Um, hard to keep him awake. You know, because he sleeps when he gets in the car. I'm like, hey, you know, we got this. We're passing by, you know. But um, we chose to spend the night in major cities. You know, we, we could have just stayed somewhere in between major cities. But we just tried to get to a major city every time we got on the road. So it would be an eight to ten hour drive day. And um, but we really just wanted to see cities and see what they were like, you know, mm -hmm. compared to other places we've been. So. That's part of it, I think. But the, the transportation thing too, I mean, the, the moving, the constant moving, kind of a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering that. That's a great question though. <laughs> thank you. Um, so we're, we're heading into our, our 10 minute mark. You, you talked about um, teaching as well as making, and I just wonder how those two have worked for you over the course of your career? Um, well, actually, the teaching that I'm, I have been doing the last few years have been really fantastic. It's a great school. I teach at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. I'm in their community education program there. Um, and I think the values that I get out of that is, yes, I'm, ex I'm sharing some of my experience, but I think I, I, I get so much energy from the students themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and even, you know, it's kind of funny. It's a different type of scenario than when I taught high school back East. Mm -hmm. And I love doing that, but it didn't afford me any time to make art myself. Right. Um, I was always busy and raising a family too. And, um, and that didn't, that wasn't, I didn't think a bad thing. It's just, that's the way it happened. Um, but now with my kids growing up and um, pretty much out of the house, it's, it's afforded me some time and then I can work on nurturing that and then I find the students very nurturing as well. So, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, the way I, it, I take a very organic approach with teaching too, um, and I, I did even in the high school. Um, I know what I'm going to present that day, but it's really up to the students. You know, they're the ones that are going to be the ones that prompt you and mm -hmm. and and bring the ideas into the class, and then you try to basically help them through it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, without going overboard. I mean, I'm not going to be. I want them to get that experience, so right. uh, it's a great balance. You know, you just kind of like, okay, you can do it this way. Give it a try. You know, right? Um, and um, but it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So what is the most important thing you've learned to date about your practice? Uh, how valuable it is. Um, time is against me. And mm -hmm. um, I think it should be against everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm having a great deal of anxiety about getting things done. And mm -hmm. um, um, so I'm here a lot. Even mm -hmm. during the COVID epidemic, you know, or pandemic as we're going through, um, I couldn't not be here. You know, it's like, it was my sanity. Yeah, I can't go to the gym. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's right. like, I can't go to the school, can't go to the library. You know, there's a lot of places I can't go, but this has been a good safe haven for me right. uh, to spend half my day 
or more um, and just get work done and, and get occupied into this. So um, that's the most important thing is it's like creative time is extraordinarily valuable. It's good for your spirit and soul and all of that. And I've been denied that for a while, but now I'm getting it back and it, it just feels amazing. What do you still want to learn? Um, I saw that question, you know, because he sent me a couple of questions and I couldn't really, I think those things come up, you know what I mean? Um, when it happens, I'm like, okay, I got to figure this out, you know? Um, I mean, there's things that I'm learning right now, like mm -hmm. how to do 3D uh, graphics and, and rendering in Rhino, um, mm -hmm. which is a program. Um, but I mean, those are kind of like necessities for what I do. And, but I think those things kind of just come up as they happen. I don't have a bucket list of like, mm -hmm. this is what I want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, it just it just happens, you know. It's a very natural thing for me. What um what is coming up next for you, or something we should know that we don't know? Shows, exhibitions, projects. Um, actually, I I um, I'm planning to go to if it still happens, and it's roughly in February. Uh, I'm going to be a art vendor at something called Modernism Week in uh, Palm Springs. Okay. California. So uh, I'm still waiting to get information from them, but Great. they know I'm interested. Um, there was an exhibit I was going to shoot for in Roseville, but I realized I wasn't going to make any money at it. So I decided not to do it. It was one of these things where you could make a, a picture or a painting or something every day for 30 days, and then you just basically compile them all mm -hmm. into a board. And it's just... Um, for what I do, it's it's way more complicated, and um, and for what I want to put out there and project out there as my work, nearly impossible. So, right. Um, especially right now, um, right. I don't have access to a lot of things, and I just right. can't do it. So, but right. um, Modernism Week is what I'm shooting for, and okay. that should be in the next year. And um, I think it's February or March. Great. Well, Palm Springs yeah. is my favorite place. I've never been there, but I love the pictures. Well, so. if you like mid-century modern. Yeah. 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 Um, I do. I really do. <laughs> I sense that. I sense that. Um, so we are getting close to our time. Um, I think that, again, everybody, if they haven't already checked out, um, Todd's website should definitely do that. Um, you know, as always, this is our opportunity to learn from artists that are in the field, what they're doing, how they navigate. And I think that you've shared a lot with us, which I knew that you would. And I'm so pleased that we had this time to, to get together and, and just talk. It's so yeah. always nice to hear about what you're doing and how it's all evolved and to see the work and to see the space. I think the space looks amazing uh, as well. It just seems like I think all the juices are flowing and it's so great. To, it's good, I'm sure it's challenging for you to have so much that you want to do, but it's very exciting for us to see what's coming. Oh good, I'm glad it was exciting. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I hate to think I die dull, you know? No, 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 not at all. Um, and again, you know, <clears throat> it's funny. I think people, when they watch, they always wonder or, or wish they would have asked a question. And and that is just, I think, an opportunity for artists to, for us to reach out to you. But everybody mm -hmm. knows that this will actually be archived on our MCLA YouTube channel. So it'll be able to be accessed later. Yes with everyone but I think most importantly Veronica and I want to say thank you thank you for oh, thank you with us and sharing your work and your thoughts and all that good stuff so thank you oh, it's great it's yeah. great seeing you absolutely and we're definitely going to be uh, coming back to see what work you've done so expect another visit from us okay great I all look right. forward to it Yes. Thanks so much, Absolutely. Todd. Thanks, Veronica, right. for your help. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And we yeah. will see you next time. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Take care. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.